Hello, Dr. Schmidt Olabisi. Hello, it's good to see you. Yes. (laughs) Please call me Laura. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you have been um, such a great mentor, really, on the climate crisis in our Magnolias group. But I'm really curious first, got to ask, what drew you to joining the Magnolia Moonshot? Sure. Well, there were a couple of things. So I'm, as you mentioned, a scientist uh, and a professor at Michigan State University. And I work on climate change, particularly in how it relates to agricultural systems, both in the United States and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've been working on this issue for quite some time. And it has come to the point where I feel that science is not enough. We need to be working together across multiple sectors, uh, nonprofit sector, the business sector, scientists, activists. We really need to be working together to solve the climate crisis. And I was really intrigued by joining a group that is looking to do that, but also bring a new kind of leadership in and talk about how uh, the principles of leadership that women embody are really critical in solving the major problems we face today. And I deeply feel that, uh, both as a woman in science and as an observer of the world. Um, Say more about that. Well, because I think that, uh, you know, a more female style of leadership, which to be clear, I think people of any gender can embody, but you tend to see more in women. um, And that style of leadership is more collaborative, more about coalition building, more about empathy and extending care to all people in all uh, sectors of the environmental world. And I think that that's what we need right now. Um, we, we can't go into this crisis thinking of it as a zero sum game where we're trying to win and somebody else is trying to lose because we're really all in this together. And when I look around, I see that the people embodying that kind of leadership in the climate world, whether it's from science or from politics or from activism are predominantly women. And so I'm really interested in how we can bring those uh, qualities uh, and elevate them and celebrate them and, and learn from them in a broader scale. And I think that's what the Magnolias are trying to do. Climate justice. What does climate justice mean to you, Laura? Well, I think a lot of times in the United States, when we talk about the climate crisis, we talk about it in in terms of polar bears or butterflies, uh, which are important and and valuable. But really, the thing that scares me the most about the climate crisis is how it is going to impact people and particularly the most marginalized people on the planet. And so just as an example, um, I work in smallholder agricultural systems in sub-Saharan Africa, which means agricultural systems where people are cultivating maybe one or two hectares. Um, And those are extremely vulnerable to shifts in climate. And there are some estimates that sub-Saharan Africa could lose 25% of its agricultural productivity due to climate change on a continent that already is struggling to feed itself. And that has really, really startling implications. Even here in the United States, you know, people in uh, communities that are already suffering burdens of environmental pollution, uh, in inner city environments, higher rates of asthma, that's going to be exacerbated by climate change. Almost down the line, you see that climate change is going to be worsening inequalities all around the world, and people are going to be hurt by it, and they already are being hurt by it. And so there's a really strong justice component to this. And so I appreciate that the Magnolias also are trying to bring that together and talk about both climate and uh, justice. I think they go hand in hand and we really can't address one without addressing the other. We've also talked so much over the past year about racism and Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and for you, this is, this is personal. Um, say a little bit about what your experience has been with your family. Sure. Well, uh, my husband is uh, originally from Nigeria. So he was born and and grew up in Africa, uh, West Africa, and then uh, emigrated here. Uh, And we have a nine-year-old son. Um, We have been fortunate to have lived in mainly university communities that are fairly diverse and uh, progressive. And so we haven't, as a family, personally experienced a lot of vitriol or, or conflict. But certainly this period in American history has taken a toll on our family. Um, 
I mean, I think my husband uh, had to, it was interesting because he grew up in a place where, uh, you know, it was Africa, so everybody looks like him. And uh, he, he had to learn what it meant to be, you know, black in the United States when he moved here and really educated himself on that history and, and what was going on. And I think he's really, um, he's really disappointed in the country right now, to be honest, uh, that these things are still happening and we haven't addressed it. And I understand that. Um, I think it is the, one of the worst legacies of our country's history that we still have not completely reckoned with and we still have not completely addressed. And um, we really have to look at it honestly. And the good thing is that I think in the last few years, I see a lot more people willing to talk about it and to face, you know, the truth about what, you know, the really terrible things that we've done and that have gone on um, in the name of white supremacy in this country. People are even using the term white supremacy. Uh, so I have a little bit of hope that we're starting to at least be honest. Laura, you mentioned the word hope. <laughs> the word that I'm holding close to my heart these days. What gives you hope about where we are in the present and the trajectory that you see? What's, what do you, you envision? What gives me hope is young people. Um, so I, I teach young people in my role at the university and um, they are incredibly committed and passionate and you know, I don't want to dump all of our responsibility on them because they already have a lot on their plates right now, especially with the pandemic. But I think that they are, they have a completely different attitude about both of these things we've been talking about actually than, than even people of my generation do. Um, and are very committed to dealing with climate across, interestingly, across ideological divides. And I would say that's the other thing that actually gives me hope is that it's important to remember that the conversation in the United States is not the global conversation, right? So there are people all over the world that, and leaders all over the world that are committed to doing something about this crisis. There are leaders at the state and local levels all across the United States. I think sometimes we uh, are in danger of elevating the loudest, most contrary voices and thinking that those are more important than they need to be. Or the majority when they're not. They're not a majority, exactly. The majority of Americans are concerned about climate change and want to do something about it. And that does give me hope.